um, members of the public media and everybody who's, who's, who's on the platform. Uh, yeah, welcome to the Standing Committee on Appropriations meet, meeting. Uh, today, uh, <clears throat> we, we are meeting with the, the uh, Department of Social Development uh, to deal with the second special appropriation bill. That's the purpose of today's meeting. Uh, but before we can do anything else, um, Darren, do you have any apologies? Person, yes, uh, uh, we received an apology from the Minister of Social Development. She indicated that she will join the meeting, but she needs to leave earlier because uh, because of cabinet loss of life. Yes, it's your person. Okay, thank you. No, ni, in, no, any other. Um, no, chair person, I don't believe any other apology. Okay, I think I think we, we must then we must then just pro proceed. As I've indicated, so, 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 sorry, Chairperson. Uh, Shaky Mom, I'm actually traveling, uh, but I will be with the meeting in any event, but I'll have my video off in any event. Thank you for that, Chairperson. Most welcome. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh. Um, as I was saying, Honorable Members, uh, <clears throat> today we are, in, uh, we are interacting with uh, the <clears throat> Department of Social Development on the second special appropriation bill. Uh, let me start by uh, well, well, welcoming the honorable minister, uh, Minister Lindy Wezulu, uh, with, uh, with, with the team from, from the department. And, and thank you for, uh, for availing yourself. Um, the minister is serving a, a cabinet hotel, but she's just told time to be uh, with us. And uh, we, I have been informed that you'll, you'll be leaving us, I think, uh, that's quite in, in order, but we are very much uh, appreciative of your time. As uh, I was saying, uh, the, just to, to recap, the second special appropriation bill, um, it's uh, the government's intervention uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to deal with the, the effects of uh, the July unrest uh, in KZN and, 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 and Houting. So amongst other things which have happened, is that uh, um, uh, the government has seen it fit that uh, it must intervene and deal with again the, the KZN and Gauteng unrest impact and uh, the impact of COVID um, to try and, and, and deal with the most vulnerable section of, of our society to, um, by extending the, uh, the SRD grant up to March 20. Uh, 2022, which provides a very uh, important uh, safety net uh, uh, to to our to our people. So that's the reason that uh, uh, we are having D DSD today. We know that the bill uh, 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 is proposing a 20, 26.7 billion rand to go to the uh, uh, to the, to the department. So uh, as uh, our act requires. It's very important that we, in, we interact with the department. Uh, they have their presentation, they are responding to the letter that we sent uh, 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 to them. So we'll allow the, uh, uh, the minister and the team uh, to uh, proceed with their presentation. Uh, Honorable Minister. Honorable Minister. Um, is, is the DM on the platform? DG? DG? Yes. I, I've just been informed that the minister is struggling with connection. She's trying to join the meeting. Okay, okay let's, uh, let's, let's try to give the minister a, a few minutes, right? Honorable members, how are you? Good afternoon, Chairperson. Honorable Mataf, how are you? I'm okay, thank you, Chairperson, and how are you? I'm good, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Chair. 
Okay, okay, I, I see. Hey, Honorable Kaiso. Yes, I, I, I'm fine. How are you, Che? I'm good, thank you. I'm good, thank yes, you. Yes, I'm okay. <clears throat> just, 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 just say, um, Darren, you'll indicate once the 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 the, the minister has joined. Um, uh, thank you, Chairperson. I'm here. Okay, okay. Uh, yeah. Most 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 welcome. Just to uh, to 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 repeat my intro introduction. Let me start by saying that we uh, we <clears throat> we have been informed that we, we are busy with the cabinet hotler, and uh, we are very much appreciative that you you took some time and you've also been told that uh, uh, you'll be you'll be you'll be leaving us. That's that's quite that's quite in order. But uh, the the simple introduction was that uh, um, we are dealing with the second special ap appropriation bill. And the Department of of, uh, uh, of Social Development, <clears throat> uh, the Minister of Finance is proposing to give the, uh, the department twenty six point seven billion rand. So that's uh, the background to us saying let's let's interact with your good self and the department, and um, um, to hear uh, your response, for instance, to the letter that we sent, and then after that we'll be interacting with your team after you've left us. Or minister, uh, or all yours, you'll, you'll, you'll decide uh, how we, how you, how you, how you delegate. Um, I'm, I'm, you are all yours uh, until about ten past four. Or minister. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chairperson, for lending me your ears. Um, for now, um, thank you very much, Honourable Swiso. Tell us, it's always a pleasure for us to be. Uh, back at this uh, uh, um, uh, standing committee on, appro on appropriation on the second special appropriation bill. Um, honorable members uh, of the appropriations committee, um, fellow South Africans, those who do get a chance and get time to uh, log in or, or, or join in when such meetings are, are taking place because we are very conscious of the fact that these meetings are public and we are very conscious of the fact that this is our way to of accounting um, to, to, to uh, parliament. I will go back Chairperson and thank you for the opportunity because to present the report uh, of social development, namely the Department of Social Development, the South African Social Security Agency, SASA, and the National Development Agency, NDA, before the committee. I do want to indicate again, Chair, that we're doing everything we can um, as a department, as we call ourselves, uh, the portfolio. We're doing the best that we can, that at all times we speak to each other, we connect with each other, we plan with each other, we coordinate with each other, so that whatever we are doing, we are sure that it speaks um, to the main mandate of the Department of, of Social Development. Previously, when the department appeared before the committee, or a few, uh, a few among us agreed, uh, agreements were made, one, a, recommend, a, a recommend, recommitment to deliver social development services is a matter that improves the safe state of our people. We talk about the state of our people because a chairperson we believe that at all times, if we are conscious of whatever is happening to our people at any given moment, we are then able to respond and adjust as quickly as we possibly can, but obviously, the, the responding uh, to that is not only in the preview of the Department of Social Development, but is it, it is with government um, overall. And so we do also try to take advantage of other interventions that are being made by government. And we try by all means that we connect with those interventions and not work in isolation. The second one is the prioritization of interventions that fulfill our constitutional aspirations. The third one is devising innovative approaches to the employment of social service professionals. And the fourth one, strengthening the capacity of civil society organization as the uh, extension of the state. And here we state, um, Chairperson, that um, the, the, the amount of money that we spend, that government spends on civil society organizations, and in our case in particular, the NPOs, is, is quite uh, big. 
And therefore for us, we always see them as almost an extension of what we need to do because most of them are closer uh, to the people. And therefore specifically today, the committee requested that we provide with one, a report on the proposed allocation of 26.2 billion towards the social relief of distress, as you indicated in your, in your opening remarks. Two, a comprehensive report on the proposed allocation of 500 million towards the enhancement of SASA's grant application, data management and payment system. And I think that when SASA makes its presentation, they will be able to give you a breakdown, they'll give the committee a breakdown of that. Three, a detailed report on the uptake, distribution and challenges faced by SASA in the implementation of the COVID-19 SRD grant. And four, an appraisal of how the department has dealt with both the social and economic impact of COVID-19, as well as the recent unrest in Wazulu Natal and Gauteng provinces, respectively. Can I please close the door? I think they've started. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. My apology, Chair. I was closing the door because the, the, the other meeting is now um, has now just started. Um, I will touch on a few points relating to these. And Chairperson, I will then ask the acting director general and the chief executive officers to a uh, board of SASA and NDA to elaborate the re relevant details. Um, enhancement of SASA grant application data management and payment system. South Africa has a well-developed social assistance framework that from time to time, we adjust to target specific population amongst the poor. The phasing in of the child support grant in case is a case in point of how it is possible. SASA pays just over 18 million social grants via the legacy social grants payment and administration system, which is called SOCPEN, that dates back to the 1930s. And they will tell you how much I'm on it about, you know, there's a need for us to change this so that it can respond um, to today's needs and it can also respond to the technology that is moving very fast and things are becoming easier uh, to do and SASA will elaborate on that if necessary. In order to be responsive to population realities as well as the dynamic big data needs today, SASA will achieve higher efficiencies with a rigorous grant application, data management and payment system. With it, we will improve the lives of the poor and enable the social reconstruction and recovery initiatives to reach each and every qualifying beneficiary. And then the incidences of violence in Guazul Natal and Gauteng provinces, um, immediately following the incidences of social unrest, violence and economic disruption in parts of Guazul Natal and Gauteng provinces, and with the support of one of our multilateral partners, the United Nations Children's Fund, which we normally call UNICEF, the Department of Social Development conducted rapid assessments on the impact of these incidences on social development services using the real-time monitoring tool or the RTMT and the report uh, chairperson and honorable members is available. And we thank the United Nations for having uh, been agile enough to be able to respond and assist us on this. The tool specifically, specifically found that number of services and the state of the people were adversely affected in two districts of Guazulu Natal province, food security, economic participation and child and protection deteriorated significantly owing to these incidences. This, the, this brief episode of the destruction of our social fiber and economic infrastructure threatens to worsen our long-term reconstruction and recovery efforts if it is not urgently prioritized. Within the already unbearable conditions that COVID-19 has brought into our lives, these incidences have deepened the experience of hunger, abuse and neglect, post-traumatic stress disorders and economic exclusion across the population. And I do want to make the statement, Chairperson, that when it comes to the issue of post-traumatic stress disorder and economic exclusion, it has affected our people across the board. 
in particular, our communities and black communities, because even your middle class has been terribly and adversely um, uh, affected. Our experience with the real-time monitoring tool reinforces our call that we need to invest in data management infrastructure that will bring government to the people's felt needs. Thus, the digitization improved case management and targeted monitoring and evaluation of social development are imperative towards fast tracking our interventions at the cold face where our people live. On this backdrop, the department responded by invoking its social protection mandate, taking into social development services to the people, providing food to the affected individuals and vulnerable households, rendering psychosocial support services, and implementing social relief of distress voucher and grants. Meanwhile, child protection services were provided and communities were mobilized towards rebuilding, restoring their infrastructure and their livelihoods. And we take it, Chairperson, that it is not just the responsibility of government to do that. We need to create a conducive environment, but at the same time, we must create that environment and enable our people to mobilize themselves towards rebuilding and restoring their infrastructure and in particular, their livelihoods. May these unfortunate incidences, the most immediate reminder of how fatal and disabling our pre-democracy conflicts molded our commitment to protect our common heritage Recording in progress. and her people's collective. And we say this particularly at this month, which is a month um, of uh, our heritage. Consequently, the department, the department and its entities will present to you a detailed value proposition that supports these priorities. Our interventions offered South Africa's practical opportunities that brought meaning into the lives of our people. I wish to thank you, Chairperson, for the opportunity. And then through you, the DG will, um, will introduce the presentation and the, the CEOs both of SASA, um, and Meto Zimemela, and uh, NDA Me Tamo Mzobe. Thank you very much. Thank, thank, thank you, Minister. Before you, 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 you I'm not running away. I'm still here a little bit. Yes. Okay, but yes. there's just one, 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 one question. Um, uh, the the DG of DSD has be, has, has been acting. When are you making that position permanent? Uh, you know the problems of acting and so on and so forth. When are you making it uh, permanent? Yes, uh, uh, Chairperson, we started because unfortunately we had so many of uh, the, the people who were acting and in particular with the DDGs. So we have started with the DDGs, we advertised and, and we'll finalize that. And then we'll also advertise for the DG. And, and I don't think that's gonna take us long. I, I'm unfortunately unable to give you a specific date, but as soon as we finish with the DDGs, then we will deal with the DG. Thank you very much, Chair. Okay, it's 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 more about uh, ra ra raising a, a concern, honourable uh, minister, uh, that the it is it does become problematic when uh, uh, the senior officials are acting in departments. But I'm I'm sure you are you are, you are noting that. Um, let me uh, uh, go go to to the DG then, um, as the minister has requested. But thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, good afternoon to you and the members of the committee. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to um, uh, share this afternoon uh, some of the interventions um, uh, that um, we have worked through um, and some of the proposals in terms of the work that we're going to be taking forward um, as the minister indicated. I think we were last with the committee in April or May, if I'm not mistaken, and there were a number of matters that the committee had raised uh, with us during the session as well as post the session. Uh, and uh, there were, for example, matters around uh, women and youth enterprises, um, you know, and our procurement uh, um, uh, and how we work around the procurement aspects in relation to supporting women and youth enterprises. We also spoke a bit about our community nutrition and development centers. We gave you an update in terms of our Vangasali program, which is a program we work jointly with Nelson Mandela Foundation on, in terms of trying to get uh, ECTs in place, as well as 
the economic stimulus uh, relief uh, measures uh, and the social protection measures, which I will touch on a little later in response to uh, one of the questions that the committee has posed uh, in terms of um, unemployment inequality and poverty. And um, I think what I'd like to do, if we could put the presentation on the screen very quickly, I'll ask the CFO to put that presentation on the screen. Um, I think by way of context, I think the minister has really uh, 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 started speaking at length um, about some of the aspects related to it. I don't think I'll spend a lot of time uh, dealing with that, um, but um, safe to say that um, um, uh, the interventions that we make as a department in line with the mandate that we provide, uh, which is uh, care uh, and support services to vulnerable groups through the implementation of social security measures, um, uh, we view these as investments in, um, in citizens. Um, and uh, why do we view them as investments? Because we think that it's important uh, that they become self-sustainable and contribute to the economy. So when we do these interventions, we're actually unlocking the potential to ensure that they're able to... Can we go to the next slide, please, one? Um, at the, I'm on slide number four already. Uh, oh, sorry, I won't even get into the purpose. I think we're pretty clear on that. The minister's outlined that. Um, and then just to indicate that indeed the pandemic has had a very profound socioeconomic impact uh, um, on, on the poor and also uh, households in, in the country. And of course, um, uh, this has um, uh, increased levels of food insecurity um, to a large extent um, and vulnerability due to the loss of employment and income for millions of people who had uh, been working and of course been affected by COVID-19. Um, okay, of course we, um, the pandemic came at a time when we uh, were experiencing high levels of food insecurity. Hunger increased from about 4.3% to about 7% according to statistics South Africa. Uh, and uh, this translated to about uh, 13 million people. I think some people work between the range of 10 to 13 million people who are, um, 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 oops, who are, um, who are um, uh, in, in essence, um, uh, do not have adequate access to food. Uh, and I think that, um, as uh, part of the relief measures we've introduced, the 350 grant, of course, we are now in the second iteration, and this was one of the urgent interventions that we made. Uh, and we'll speak a little bit more about the, about the interventions, uh, or rather about the second iteration as we move along. Go to the next slide. Um, I think um, I, I will speak a little later about the specifics in terms of the challenges faced in KZN and Kauken, um, how those came about, and how we intervened as a portfolio in line with the request from the committee. Um, uh, of course, um, which led largely to a high levels of unemployment um, and in a way perpetuated social economic challenges, uh, including poverty and inequality. Um, and, um, um, you know, the fact that we were, we had such high levels of inequality and poverty was possibly part of the reasons why we also had the challenges that we had in terms of the unrest. Um, and then a significant amount of jobs, of course, were lost during this time as indicated. Um, and um, this is an additional um, to this is in addition to the approximately 550,000 or so jobs lost during the first to the third wave. And again, some uh, analysts think that we lost much more. These are only just reported numbers. Um, and I think of significant importance is the mid plan survey, which suggested that in wave two, about 45 percent of the upbound uh, poor uh, in wave one became either poor food poor. Or fell into the lower bound uh, poverty. Again, um, just not to go into the specifics there, but just to say that the minister visited um, both KZN and Kauteng, including the deputy minister, um, uh, in specific areas, uh, largely to um, uh, you know to look at the impact of the services um, uh, on uh, on um, and and on our citizens uh, that we render as a portfolio, but also to assess the damage caused by um, our facilities. Um, and again. Uh, we were part of the portfolio committee meeting, um, uh, oversight rather, that went both to KZN and Kauteng, um, again, to assess and uh, to bring in some measures that we got. I'll ask the CFO to touch on some of these aspects and then we'll go into Shasa. Then I'll come back a little, a little bit later. CFO, if you could continue from here. Thank you, Dizzy, and good afternoon, all members uh, and, um, and Mr. Um, just in terms of the, the allocations that we received, uh, for the special adjustment. Um, that's why we're here today, is that the allocations for the social grant, the 26.2 billion that's been allocated for the SRD, SRD and the top up. Um, and that will be continuing up to the end of March, 2022, to the amount of 26.2 billion. 
And then the 500 million that's been allocated for SASA, for the SASA administration and the system enhancements. Then we also felt it good that we include the additional funding. CF, CFO. Yes, Chairperson. CFO, sorry to, to interrupt you. Um, the 26.2 billion rand and the 500 million rand are, are the proposals to come to the department and to SASA. They're not yet allocated. Eh? So don't put the 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 the, the cut before the horse. Okay. We, are, we, under, we understand that the technicality of it. So yes, that's, yes, that's, that's why that's why we are here so that you convince the committee that you really need to do this so that the committee can go and try to convince the parliament. Okay. okay. Continue. My apologies, Chairperson. Okay, so the allocations is proposed is the 26.2 and then the 500 million. What's also been given to us uh, by Treasury is the extension of the presidential uh, stimulus package. Um, the funding that they proposed there is for the extension of the volunteer program to the NDA. The amount there is 30 million. That will also go up until the end of March 2022. Then there's a phase two of the ECD conditional grant. Um, the amount allocated or proposed there is 178 million. And then the, the other worrying fact was the, the, again, the continuation of our social workers that we currently employed in the prior financial year, the 1,800. Uh, they've given us, uh, well, they're proposing 120 million for that purpose. Uh, and it will also uh, run up until the end of March, uh, 2022. Then in terms of, this is just the proposal that was now published in the Special Appropriations Bill. Um, the, we see the allocations for the 26.2 billion and the 500 million. And that's why we're here to discuss and convince the committee that we are going to utilize this funding for these intended purposes. Um, this is in the allocation letter. It clearly announces that, that what the president announces on the 25th of July, that we're going to continue with the SRD uh, with a monthly payment of 350 up to the end of March 2022. And the conditions there is that it will cater for up to 9.4 million people in distress. Um, Chairperson, um, DG, must I now hand over to the CEO of, CEO of SASA to take us through their different slides? Yeah, I think we can go to SASA now um, at this point. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Chairperson. Thank you very much, um, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. Um, my name is Tsageri Wachauga, the CFO of SASA. Um, I will be taking you through based on the proposed allocation of the 500 million um, that is proposed to be allocated to SASA. Um, here, what we are saying, Honorable Chair, is that since the the inception of the special COVID-19 SRD grant. This was a very fairly complex um, issue because we needed to really start with the payment processes um, with immediate um, agency. And, and therefore we needed to make sure that we look at all the citizens, we reach all the citizens, but also to make sure that those that are eligible, uh, they get the access to apply, but also to be paid. We also contracted the services of an external service provider to assist us uh, just to develop the web um, service for application. We also considered the partnership with GovChat just to make sure that we improve the platform through which people can apply. But we also considered that not all citizens of the country are able to use or they have access to a smartphone. And therefore we have used the USSD as a platform uh, in the initial uh, phase, it was another great access point that we did. But we also had to be mindful of the duplications that may exist in terms of dealing with the data, but we also needed to develop and implement the application programming um, interfaces, which had to do with the validation of data across all the databases in phases that we implemented this. Um, Honorable Chair, you will note that SASA has always used a database system called SOPEN, and that's where the main grants are being paid from. 
and just to make sure that we make the changes there, it wasn't just this easy thing, it will have taken long. So we did look at a way to augment um, the SOCPAN system just to at least create another platform through which we can at least get the applications and the payments be done. Thank you. Next slide, please. Honorable Chair and honorable members, um, one of the requests by the committee was to indicate what is um, our proposal uh, to deal with the 500 million if it gets to be allocated to SASA. Um, the, the bulk of this amount uh, goes to um, our, our relationship with post office. And, and here, honorable chair, is that most of our people, they've utilized the post office as the easy access. Uh, therefore, most of this amount will go to the over-the-counter services that we're paying uh, post office 17 rand 25 um, rand, 17 rand 25 rand uh, per person or a beneficiary service over the counter. And, and that is the bulk of it. Um, we have made an estimation that probably we'll be paying about um, 6 million. And, and if this was to increase, we have already made um, some alternatives just to move people from the off the over the counter services uh, to create other platforms like your, the use of the NPS system. Um, the, the other part that we have looked into, Honorable Chair, is the bank charges. Um, currently, you're looking at one run nine cent um, per, per transaction through the banks, um, and therefore makes about 5.7 um, million of, of the people that are being paid on monthly basis because the validation um, happens on monthly basis, not the ones of thing that we need to look into. The, the third element um, which we looked at is the risk mitigators. The risk mitigators, this is where we, we try to mitigate against the risk of fraud. Um, therefore, we interface with some of the institutions uh, like the South African Fraud Prevention Services, the TransUnion, and the Experian. And this is we pick up any exceptions of the people that may apply within the, the, the agency. And therefore, uh, the systems allow us to flag and validate those transactions and isolate them and pay that um, attention to that detail. So it doesn't cost that much, just under 100,000 per month that, that we are looking at spending around it. One of the key issues is the SM notifications. That is the feedback that we need to give to our, all the beneficiaries. Um, so we do have a contract that we're using for the purposes of sending the SMS notifications. And we're thinking that if we allocate this money, we'll be able to utilize the 8 million uh, or 7.8 .9, million uh, just the communication on the SMS platform. We use the USSD cost. The USSD cost is the platform in which you can utilize the mobile uh, phone to apply for the grant, uh, whether you are using your normal um, basic uh, cell phone or using the smartphone. And therefore, we have the number that we give to people, which was the most popular platform in terms of the application. Uh, in terms of the system enhancement, uh, Chair, I will be able to really at least deal with it because you want that in detail in the next slide, and I will come back to it, but we'll spend about 28 million. So I believe that we can at least deal with it when I deal with the next slides. Uh, in terms of communication, uh, Honorable Chair, we believe that currently we have looked at the, the need to intensify communication. I think um, everywhere you're going, there is a cry that we're not communicating enough, uh, creating the platform. So what we will do is to make sure that we use the community radios, not only community radios, the commercial radios, we will also use TV when necessary. But we'll also plan to have more visible SASA uh, for people to be able to deal with it, the application process. In a case that your application is rejected, how do you do an appeal? And, and where do you go in in event that you're not satisfied? Uh, so those kind of platforms, we believe that will intensify that, which will deal with both the electronic and the print media, but not only just about the whole issue of of writing. But some of the people may not be able to read and write. We should be able to be uh, visible wherever we need to. Um, the the PPEs uh, volunteers, um, which is the six hundred and twelve thousand. 
Uh, this has to do with the linkage with ourselves with NDA, uh, assisting us with the volunteer program, but will provide the PPE to so make sure that everywhere they go, um, they are safe in that regard. In terms of the call center, um, Honorable Chair, we, we believe that as and when this is an online application, there should be at least um, a way to revert back to people or to give people access to communicate with us and to call and get clarity on it. We're spending about 5 million per month, and we believe that over the period, 42 million will be utilized just as a call center support. This is only to augment the call center uh, that we have, because we understand the number of calls that comes in are higher. So therefore, we appointed a service provider to augment that. We can move to the next slide, please. As I've indicated that um, I will deal with the 28 million um, relating to this environment. And number one, we, we wanted to separate the, the, the platforms or the environment. Uh, the environment that we started paying the 350 under, it was the environment which we had, was created for the biometric environment. And over the time, because we have seen the extension, we saw the need that we need to ring fence and at least exclude that environment um, from the biometric environment. And this will make sure that we are able to create a, a different web logic that we can at least create the ERP, which is the Oracle system that we're using. And therefore that will make sure that we are able to deal with data uh, quickly. The second thing that we're looking at is that, as I've indicated that we have already made 32 million allocated or to be proposed to be allocated to SAPO service fee. We understand that we can augment that platform by allowing certain um, beneficiaries to move from the queues that are seen uh, within SAPO and by creating a platform for the NTS um, in, in that regard. So in other words, the clients that normally would have been serviced by SAPO, we can partner with SAPO together with the merchants and, and, and other banks that we can utilize them for the purpose of drawing the benefits. The third element that we're looking at is just making sure that the new application, because we do have the new applications applicant who are caregivers, which were not part of the portfolio that of people that were applying then. And also those that are reapplying to make it easy for them uh, to enhance the capability for the system. Next slide, please. Then the other part that we are also looking at is that is exposing the SRD system um, application um, to any other database, which is the interface uh, that we need to utilize uh, with other uh, uh, databases like um, the, the Home Affairs, um, the UIF. Then we can interface with the external sources of data, and this will enhance the data quality and also uh, assist us to look at the exceptions where the exceptions are. We currently working on um, a solution with Postbank uh, just to look at the e-wallet or the, the wallet integration and the third party payment module. And this we have started the discussion and it will be implemented during the course of, of this financial year uh, just to enhance the, the payment platforms that we need to give and options to the relevant uh, beneficiaries. The, this slide, um, Honorable Chair, just depict the, the platforms that people can apply using, which is the WhatsApp, and with that number, 082-046-8553, and with, use the website. We also have the GovChat link that you can at least log in and sign, and also the Facebook book. The one that has not been concluded now is the USSD, which I'll talk to it later on, uh, Honorable Chair. The, Based on what we have learned, um, just the summer high level, what we have learned um, and what we're improving in current environment. Um, we have improved the declaration and the consent uh, to strengthen the compliance to Popia. Uh, we have also looked at how the grants work. So if you go to application process, I think the communication and the, and the communication around the grants application process, it has been improved. The third element that we have done in the previous time when we did the application process, we first took the application and once you have been approved, then we revert that back to you to ask whether you have a bank account or not. This time around, we're harvesting the bank account. Whoever has a bank account, we're saying that give us that bank account, then we can go 
and check and validate the bank account. And then it allowed us to pay all the beneficiaries quicker than we did previously. And we also included on number four, you will see it later on when I talk to another slide. We have included additional information, which is quite important, which is about the educational level of the applicant. This will be assisting, will assist us uh, as a portfolio to plan ahead, but also to interface with some of the government institutions. We also um, make sure that whoever is declined the application, is subjected to the means test. It means that we check with the banks whether you do not have any other income. In the event that you appeal, then we have information ready that we can fast track your appeal process and which is an improvement. We are also committing just for the improved communication uh, that in terms of all the deadline applicants, we will inform them through the SMS of the outcome, but not only inform them, but also the reasons for the deadline so that it becomes easy to interact with our own clients. Thank you. Next slide, please. Um, yes, uh, this this slide um, chair just give the the summary of what is the application that we 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 have taken uh, by the first of September. Um, the twelve point two um, million uh, people or twelve point three million people have applied, and and this is the breakdown that forty three percent are males and fifty seven percent are females. Um, and, and we also did the breakdown that 56% of those that are applying this are retaining applicants, uh, but uh, 5.4 million, which is 44%, are completely new applicants that never applied before. Um, what we can indicate is that 62% of those that have applied for this benefit are between the ages of 18 and 35. Um, and then we are can confirm that at least 75% of, of the 9.1 million or 9.2 million, um, they have got some sort of a banking platform which they can provide the bank, process, bank accounts to us uh, to be able to process that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this, this slide, um, Honorable Chair, is just indicating, as I've already reported, the green color, you, you could see that the numbers of, of the people that are applying, which are the ages uh, below 35. And of significant, you can see that between 20 to 24 years, um, you have about 19.2 of those uh, applying in terms of the youth. So one could just indicate that the bulk of the applicants, you could see that they're ranging around the youth age, um, which is quite very significant. And, and this is the breakdown of um, the, all the categories in terms of the age. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide chair, does indicate just the breakdown per province, but also in terms of the South African citizenship, which is about 99.8 of, of that, and the permanent resident uh, sitting at 0.2%, mm -hmm. and with the refugees 0.03, uh, um, then that's uh, the refugees. So this is the breakdown in terms of what the members may, may be interested, but also it gives the, the, the provincial breakdown. Of, of how did the, each province fare in this in this category? Next slide, please. Uh, th this one chair is the slide that indicates that of those that have applied, um, as we have indicated, um, the, the 6.9 million that were approved of, of those that have applied and 4.7 uh, million have been paid uh, amounting to 68% payment. I can confirm that we have spent 1.6 billion as of, of, of the end of, of, of August, beginning of, of September, uh, just to honor these payments, 1.6 um, billion. That is the amount that we can commit in, in this regard. The next slide, please. I did indicate, Honorable Chair, that uh, we have decided that we can at least harvest additional information. This will assist for planning purposes, but also assist uh, members uh, to, to consider the state of the country in some of the areas that may require intervention. 2.2% uh, of those that have applied, um, they have no schooling. 9.7% uh, have completed them, uh, the primary level of schooling. 38.6% uh, have, have done schooling up until grade 10. And 42%, they have up until uh, uh, grade 12. 
and 7.4 percent on the report chain they have some level of tertiary education i think with this kind of information it, it can assist not only for the dsd portfolio but also to engage with some of the other institutions um, intervention programs it will influence some of the programs that need to be done by government because this information is very crucial to understand how do we link some of the beneficiaries or those that we believe that are in part of the database that we can say um, if ever then there are any other job opportunities within government we can look at the 7.4 percent of those that have some level of education if we want to really do some of the buzzers we can deal with that so the next slide uh, the next slide this is just at a high level just to indicate the the, the successes and challenges at a high level uh, one of the recorded challenges that we know of is that since the time the minister opened the application on the 6th of, of August, um, we have seen more women applying compared to the phase one. And this could be as a result of the caregivers, because now the caregivers, the primary caregivers are allowed to apply previously those that were in receipt of CSG on behalf of their own children or the children that under their care, they were not allowed to apply or they will not qualify. This time around, because that was open to them, we have seen that movement. There is also a quick resolution of the technical challenges. So if ever then we have got a system challenge of whatever, um, the turnaround it has improved significantly in this regard. Um, then on the first day of the application in the first week, we have seen number of people coming uh, on the uh, on the platform on the application as compared to the initial time when this grant was introduced uh, some key challenges uh, that we have seen, we have experienced which we're currently dealing with is the finalization of the ussd um, previously sasa did born did take care of all the costs relating to the application using the mobile application the ussd we have changed this and we're currently finalizing it with the, with, with the service providers, the network providers, so that we can share cost with the applicants uh, because we found it to be very expensive if we were to really do it from SASA only. Uh, the other part that we have not completed, which we're currently busy with, it is the contract with the banks so that we can do the, the mobile payments, uh, which is the cash send. Uh, with the banks. So this is under the procurement with assisted by BASA to conclude that contract with the banks because those previous ones did expire um, uh, during the, the first and the second um, um, uh, extensions. The other part that we have looked into is that because it is costly to use over-the-counter services and both Sabo has been carrying at uh, this burden, we have opened up this uh, just to look at option to use the NPS. Uh, which means that we can have some sort of agreement through SAPO uh, to utilize some merchants like pick and pay or whatever other merchants that may be available that, that we can contract to. And then also we are looking at using the ATMs with some of the banks uh, so that we can offload the number of people that were paying through SAPO. Previously, we paid just around 3 million people that were channeled through SAPO which was quite a very hectic um, uh, work to do. So we are looking at just moving some of those people um, to go to, to the other platforms. But also we were waiting to say, because we are increasing the, a little bit of the fee for Sabum from 15 Rand to 70 Rand 25. And we are including the new platform, which is the use of the NPS. This is a new fee structure that will require Treasury to engage with. We have already requested Treasury to consider that. And once it's done, then we can conclude uh, some of the issues relating to the payments of, 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 of beneficiary through SAPO platform. Thank you, uh, uh, DG. Thanks, CFO. If you could go to the next slide. Um, just very quickly, Chair, you also asked us about our interventions during uh, COVID-19, uh, but also our specific interventions with regards to uh, KZN and Kauteng, and I can be very quick in this regard. Um, I think part of what this uh, CFO has also spoken to is around uh, the fact that we've introduced a very rapid uh, uh, automation and digitization uh, um, uh, sort of uh, process within the organization and our, and our agencies um, to ensure that 
we try and find a way of improving our efficiencies, but also we are able to uh, address uh, uh, challenges and what, what we call the felt needs of the ground in a much speedier manner. So we've invested quite heavily in, in ICT infrastructure across the portfolio, uh, and uh, we were then able to also ensure that people were able to um, uh, to, to to access our services virtually um, or, 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 or or digitally, particularly for example the Greek of grant, which we had a hundred percent digital uptake on. But also um, um, uh, we um, we indicate I think the CFO may have indicated that we also uh, continued with our efforts to try and employ additional social workers. Uh, and I think we work in around 1,800 additional. Of course, this is merely enough to address the social ills, the rising social ills rather, in our country, uh, particularly um, uh, um, uh, you know, areas around gender-based violence, substance abuse, et cetera. But of course, this was compounded with uh, aspects of trauma uh, and uh, counseling, both affected and infected uh, uh, with uh, COVID-19 as well. I think um, part of what we also tried to do with the Department of Health is improve uh, um, uh, aspects around social behavioral change. Uh, through a ministerial advisory council that is established between the two uh, departments. Uh, and again, the, the, the entire aspect around dealing with challenges in society around social behavioral change became important to us. Uh, and we started intervening on the ground, uh, having uh, specific um, uh, workshops, engagements, uh, dialogues, as well as um, uh, uh, you know, handing out information with regards to um, uh, 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 this particular aspect. It went from COVID-19 to other matters, so we introduced this entire notion of social behavioral change across the board in terms of some of the work that we do, because we have to often respond to social goals uh, as a department. We also provided PPE um, to uh, the sector, more so ECDs. Uh, I think we did um, uh, quite a lot of that to actually augment some of our work, um, uh, some of our funding rather, that was originally uh, directed to infrastructure because of the urgent need. We then had to augment with the approval of Treasury uh, into providing PPEs for ECDs. Uh, and of course, um, um, you know, I think um, uh, our food security interventions were very important, um, and um, uh, including our response to gender-based violence and alcohol abuse, et cetera. Just with regards to KZN very quickly, these are the sort of areas that we really had uh, our interventions in. I have to go back one slide, um, um, back, back again twice. Um, um, so access, to, okay, let's go to the next one, uh, Fanny. These are the six areas in essence that we intervened in, but these are the areas that were mostly affected in Gauteng. Um, uh, you'll see that uh, Balk has been in Soweto uh, and, uh, um, and Alex uh, and Kipis Town. Uh, and uh, you'll see also that the number of malls were affected. These are malls where uh, grant recipients used to go and collect uh, their monies, but also used to buy food uh, at some of these uh, shopping centers and malls. Of importance is the fact that in Soweto, I think it is, uh, we lost the number of documents in that our SASA offices were also uh, looted um, uh, in that area. So uh, we are you know, trying to really deal with some of the challenges there uh, in terms of ensuring that uh, we get the beneficiary, beneficiary lists uh, up and away so that uh, we can be able to provide support to recipients. Next slide. Um, just uh, very quickly, these are the areas that were affected in KZN. And again, just to summarize the, 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 the impact on our services as PSD uh, was um, you know, a serious damage to our offices, infrastructure, computers, furniture, uh, equipment and even PPE stolen and looted, and in some cases damaged the vehicles uh, and uh, vandalized. Um, uh, and uh, uh, um, of course, this impacted on the on disruption of our services. Um, you know, the interesting thing, if I can share with you very quickly, is the fact that in um, in 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 um, in KZN, for example, um, you know, we were at a, a place where, and I'll show you a little later. Um, uh, uh, we were at a place though where the minister went to visit and um, there was almost a, a car dealership uh, and um, people, uh, when they looted that particular car dealership, they literally took keys from the cars that were on the floor and drove the cars into the walls. And that just shows the level of anger, um, you know, that, uh, that people had when they were, um, when they were, when they were um, uh, of course, uh, um, uh, you know, conducting these, um, uh, these acts of uh, violence and unrest. And again, I think in KZN alone, um, if I'm not mistaken, our the cost uh, was around 600 million rand in terms of damages to our offices. We did, of course, intervene by ensuring that we have, uh, you know, um, uh, mobile services available. We deployed some of our trucks into some of the communities. Uh, and we also um, tried to get people into nearby uh, offices where they could get assistance uh, much closer. If you go to the next slide, 
Um, just again, in terms of social assistance, I won't spend a lot of time. Uh, at the time when the looting occurred, we think about 90% of grants were already paid. So it is about 10%, um, uh, you know, of, of the grant recipients who have not collected their grants at the time. Um, and this, uh, so it affected those clients. Uh, but uh, again, um, it, it was uh, largely retail stores that were also uh, destroyed. But we did engage with BASA, which is the Banking Association of South Africa, which uh, agreed to deploy additional mobile banking infrastructure in some of the areas where people needed to collect uh, money. Uh, but also what is uh, good that they did was to relax uh, all SAS switch fees uh, for the month of August and September. So people are not going to be charged. They can basically collect their money at any uh, ATM and so on, and there won't be charges uh, there. Of course, we also sought uh, alternative accommodation uh, in nearby vacant spaces, as indicated. And I think um, uh, we continue to work together and provide relevant reports through the various structures, including the net joint around the world. We've done an intervention that we've made in the, in the two provinces uh, and of course, now our services are fully restored uh, and um, we've got new offices in some cases in KZN, for example, we have moved into new offices uh, and uh, we are trying to, uh, you know, just ensure that we provide our, the, the services. Um, uh, we, we don't have a break in the provision of services. Next slide. Um, just uh, again, um, just in terms of uh, the food relief uh, interventions, uh, you will see that we provided uh, through our uh, CNBCs, which is our um, um, uh, community nutrition and development centers, both in KZN and Gauteng. These are meals, hot meals that were provided, cooked meals to recipients who are able to come and collect food. But over and above that, of course, we did provide, if you go to the next slide, uh, support in terms of, um, uh, next slide, uh, yeah, this one, uh, in terms of uh, our social relief of distress. I must just say that um, uh, through our social relief of distress, uh, we don't have a lot of money allocated here. Uh, we had a shortfall of about 400 million uh, that we needed to uh, ensure that uh, we feed uh, or provide food rather to people who are in distress at the time. Uh, and um, uh, both in Gauteng and KZN, we must very, um, uh, we were very appreciative, of course, of the support that, we, that came from Solidarity Fund of 100 million rand since we received this money. And um, uh, we've uh, provided um, uh, 60 million rand to KZN. 40 million rand to Gauteng, but I think of importance is also just to highlight the support and really appreciate um, the interventions by individuals, churches, interfaith leaders, business, NPOs, and other crucial players who were able to assist us um, uh, in terms of providing food to the vulnerable at the time, um, uh, both in KZN and Gauteng. Um, and of course, with the solidarity um, support, we think that we'll feed around uh, for our 138,000 people or so, we think that could slightly be that could be slightly more um, than than what is than what is predicted there. Uh, we are currently operating um, uh, on this. We we actually launched Houting a few days ago uh, to provide the support there in that regard. So very quickly, just before you go to the next slide, there were some uh, um, you may have noted, uh, chair and members, that there were some food that was of course uh, uh, confiscated by police. We did manage to engage. Uh, through a committee that we established between Procter Health and ourselves um, to find a way of getting that food into uh, the impoverished uh, um, households uh, and uh, those that were affected. So the food that was confiscated in KZN in particular in Gauteng, um, uh, there wasn't much of the food at least that was confiscated in terms of what the police had informed us, but uh, in KZN we were able to provide the food uh, through the support of NGOs um, to our families that were, that, were, that were in trouble. I think just in terms of uh, SRP, it's important just to highlight that we provide support in terms of the means that we have. So, for example, in KZN for Sasa, we had about 57 million runs, uh, and in Gauteng, we had about 66 million runs. Uh, we may not have used all of that money, but we used a significant amount of that. And uh, of course, I indicated that the shortfall is around 400, uh, with Gauteng at 171 or so, and just over 200 and um, probably 220,000 in KZN or so. Uh, 220 million rather. We can go to the next slide. Maybe just before we go to the next slide, you know, there was a call, um, particularly by the interfaith leaders, um, you know, to consider, uh, you know, amnesty for the leaders. And again, this call came to us and we uh, engaged with, uh, um, uh, uh, with uh, the relevant authorities. And uh, we did indicate that this is work that falls within the purview of, of, of the justice sector. So um, I, I, I'm not sure how they ended up closing up that gap, but I know that there were serious calls uh, for possible amnesty for those who lose it. Go to the next slide, please. Um, yes, just in terms of um, uh, psychosocial support, I may have spoken about it at the beginning. 
we did provide some uh, a range of support um, uh, during, uh, not just during the losing, but throughout the COVID pandemic, but more so in, during uh, the unrest, let me call it the unrest in Kaiser and Gauteng. Uh, we had to deploy a number of social workers to do a lot of work um, uh, in terms of uh, household profiling to determine where the areas were that needed support. Uh, and we ended up assisting people in terms of ensuring that we were able to, uh, you know, um, help them direct into the relevant offices to get uh, assistance in terms of birth certificate ID, et cetera. But I think more than anything else, we did provide a significant amount of trauma counseling to families uh, that uh, were, um, were, um, uh, were in a very difficult situation in some cases because their homes were burnt, uh, um, particularly in areas like Waystalk in, in, in Peter Maddensburg um, and um, in other areas in, 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 in Durban as well. Uh, we provided that level of support, but also importantly, there were a number of children that were arrested um, uh, who were also part of the, uh, the unrest. And I think um, what we did do is assess them accordingly in terms of the Child Justice Act and release them to their parents who are then in turn charged with the destruction of property and other related crimes um, in that regard. I think the minister has spoken at length around the, the rapid assessment that we employed, um, and essentially we piggyback on work that we had already started in case that we launched. Um, I think it was in December last year, just to gauge the impact on children uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, the, the COVID-19. Uh, and uh, I think uh, some interesting outcomes came out of that, uh, which I won't go into too much since the minister has already spoken about this. Um, I think the important thing is to highlight is that our social workers are providing the support in the context of um, serious levels of vaccine hesitancy, but also with the, with the pandemic re, 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 reaping havoc. So we had double in some cases the work that we needed to do in terms of trying to convince people to get vaccinated, addressing the issues of the pandemic, but also then addressing some of the challenges um, that, that came out as a result of the unrest in Um Then, um, yeah, this, this, I think we've got a few more slides. Um, just on this slide, just to say that um, there was, of course, um, um, I remember a particular incident in Peter Maddensburg when we went to the minister and um, a young lady who was um, really, really in a, in a difficult situation was trying to pick up the pieces. I think it was two days or so after the looting. Um, uh, was really trying to pick up the pieces with her little baby. And, um, you know, you could see that there was a sense of hopelessness. Um, uh, she was both homeless and hopeless. Uh, and um, I think we were able to also try and find a way of assisting there in that regard um, with some of the, um, the people that were in that situation. Um, I think uh, I highlighted uh, you know, the challenges around the anger, the serious level of anger, and this speaks again to the need for us to really upscale our interventions in some of the social change programs uh, and initiatives across the country. The NDA did some work with regards to provision of food parcels uh, and support in that regard, but also worked with the DTI in terms of um, 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 uh, you know, locating some of the businesses that were affected um, and uh, worked with a range of NGOs in terms of ensuring that um, we were able to get the relevant support uh, to the relevant people in various communities. Of course, you would note that there was a, uh, some challenges around uh, racism that also popped up, particularly in KZN. And I think that um, working with other government departments, especially sports, arts and culture, uh, and so on, there are some interventions which are underway to try and address the challenges there. There are a number of dialogues that have been held uh, to really try and calm the situation. And of course, um, uh, these were largely with community leaders, in some cases traditional leaders, um, to really try and find a way of engaging around the challenges that we face as a country. Um, and again, uh, you know, we work with the clergy and CSOs um, and NGOs, uh, both the private and public sector, you know, um, uh, in terms of ensuring that we call for law and order um, uh, amongst others. Um, then um, lastly, we can go to the next slide. Uh, again, this is the work around uh, social behavioral change, just to say that we needed to do this within the context of the district development model, which we tried to do uh, in areas like Eteguini and so on, uh, working within the district and the district municipalities. In Maine, uh, we tried to have some of these uh, interventions um, and a lot of focus now, of course, is around rebuilding. Uh, a lot of investor confidence has been as um, you know, has has dropped um, uh, in 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 some of these areas. Is, you know, um, so we think that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done over and above uh, some of the interventions, which were um, uh, short-term interventions, which could which could build into medium to long-term interventions. And I think that um, um, part of this is around restoring really the social fabric and the moral fiber of our communities that connect us with South Africans. Um, um, uh, and um, I think some interventions are still underway in this regard. 
we also need to take lessons from, um, you know, um, uh, um, um, from the challenges that we've learned now uh, and really work towards building a social compact. And that is everybody working to ensure that we address the challenges that we face as a country. Um, I think uh, the, this has taught us some experiences uh, both in terms of the, the pandemic, but also the challenges that we felt, the robustness uh, of our systems in order to be able to respond quickly. Um, and I think that we've, we've learned a great deal over and above the COVID-19 pandemic. If you go to the next slide, I'll just, um, I'm at the tail end now, these are just some of the pictures that show you that, um, you know, the people who are even taking some of the vehicles, uh, uh, lights, uh, fenders, et cetera, even engines were stolen in some cases. And you can really um, see the extent to which uh, people were angry when they when they when they were taking um, uh, damaging uh, these um, uh, these goods. If you go to the next slide again, yeah, you'll see roofs that are leaking. Uh, sorry, roofs that have been torn uh, apart. Um, and tiles in some cases were pulled out, uh, and uh, of course, a lot a lot of our property has been damaged. This is our property in KZN. If you go to the next slide um, um, again, you'll see some of our property at Lake City um, that has been uh, that is that is destroyed, and some of our stuff really trying to piece back the pieces together. We go to the next slide, which is the last slide, Chair. Um, again, you know, the important recommendation that we think we want to sort of drive forward here is, um, you know, the, 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 the fact that, um, you know, um, we have provided um, in the form of um, uh, income support with Uber Free Grant, um, which, uh, of course, you know, ends in March 22, um, especially for those between the ages of 18 and 60. Um, and you will have seen some of the statistics that the CFO has spoken about. Um, but we think that this needs to possibly be extended in order to address some of the challenges that we, excuse me, continue to face as a country. Uh, and um, uh, you know, there's uh, a lot of work that we've done. In essence, we've laid a platform for the introduction of a, what we call a basic income grant uh, or basic income support. Um, you know, but again, we are saying that um, this is th this is important and equally, um, you know, the need for us to link working age recipients to economic opportunities through active labor market programs, which include job placement and skilling, and thereby creating more sustainable livelihood. We strive towards this. Um, and, you know, the challenge that we have, of course, is that the economy is not creating adequate jobs. Um, and um, uh, so long as the economy is not creating adequate jobs, we have the challenge of really trying to intervene and ensure that we provide support, particularly to those uh, within that age bracket. Um, you know, just very lastly, um, uh, Chair, I just wanted to say that we, we, you know, at some point uh, we received very interesting uh, um, uh, a presentation by, um, um, and some of you may know about it, uh, the Indulamity Future Scenarios. And they speak about a range of uh, uh, possible future scenarios that will befall us as a country, um, at least by 2030, and they provide some recommendations in terms of what interventions need to be made uh, to get to us to a place where we have a country with uh, growing social cohesion, economic expansion, uh, and a renewed sense of constitutionalism that gets South Africa going. Um, and in, in essence, high growth rates, high unemployment rates, uh, um, and uh, you know, reduced inequality, reduced poverty, etc. So they make um, uh, um, um, uh, they make two assertions. One is that um, uh, unless we address the social inequalities in the country, um, you know, we will have a challenge. And in essence, what they're saying is that indeed the economic uh, interventions are critical, they're important, they must be in, uh, implemented, uh, and a lot of work has been done in that regard. We too are part of those interventions in terms of the economic reconstruction of the. And, and, and recovery plan, uh, but they're also saying that aligned to that, we've got to introduce social uh, economic measures uh, or social relief measures, such as the 350 grant, et cetera, or income support uh, that we put together. And um, um, I think that's the combination of the two, and none are mutually, uh, uh, you know, um, none are, um, they're both important and they should be done uh, simultaneously. The other important aspect that they highlight, which I think Chair responds to the question uh, that you asked, uh, in terms of the questionnaire that we received is around, uh, um, uh, they, they basically propose a six pillar uh, policy reform as a country that we should consider implementing. And part of that includes a macroeconomic policy reform to some extent, microeconomic policy reform, social policy reforms, um, uh, uh, trade and industry um, policy reforms, uh, private sector international reforms and uh, provincial growth and development plans uh, that would need to be in improved. So if we do this, uh, they argue that we'll increase uh, um, uh, economic growth, I uh, will have inclusive growth, which will in turn have a positive outlook on uh, unemployment, poverty, and inequality. Um, uh, and um, um, and uh, this will assist us in terms of expanding uh, both demand and supply uh, uh, aspects of, of, of our growth trajectory as a country. 
Chair, I think I will leave it at that. Let me just check if the CEOs have any further inputs to make. Um, um, uh, safe to say that I think I, 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 I would also then, um, if, you, if you wish, Chair, uh, we could go through just responding to some of the questions that you asked very quickly uh, in terms of the report that we received uh, before the meeting. Um, CEOs, if there's any additional input you'd like to make. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson. Good afternoon, members, uh, colleagues. I think the, the colleagues have already covered the bulk of, of the information, but I, what I wanted to highlight is the fact that there's a lot that we've learned through the process of the first phase of the grant and the learning hasn't stopped. We continue to evolve, to look at what other uh, solutions do we need to find to make sure that we impact uh, uh, the customers or the beneficiaries uh, more positively. Uh, CFO indicated that we haven't uh, rolled out USSD yet. We're engaging also the telcos to make sure that we can continue to, to reduce the, the, the cost of, of, of transacting, particularly for the, for, for the beneficiaries when they uh, go on these uh, different uh, platforms. Chair, what, what is important to highlight is that the changes that we implemented up front also have enabled our people to be able to make their own choices in terms of the platforms that they want to use. The other uh, key uh, um, issue that has been highlighted is that Many of the people that have come back, 6.8 million people that have since applied now are people that had applied uh, previously. And the fact that uh, we this time uh, ensured that uh, uh, women are also included, particularly those that are caregivers, we've seen uh, the number of caregivers being able to come into the process because as we know, the, the, the child support grant that is, is provided currently uh, is indicated to be below uh, the, the, the lower bound uh, threshold uh, in terms of poverty. So the key is for us as we mine the data, as we find the people that have applied is to look at what opportunities actually exist for government as a whole, as we plan uh, in terms of uh, one, looking at what solutions should exist in terms of anti-poverty alleviation, and also in terms of where to find the young people who are actually in the majority in this space to ensure that we create opportunities for them for the future and engage with all other government stakeholders to make sure that solutions are found for the youth who are in the majority in this instance. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Gigi. Thank you, members. Thank you, CEO. I'm not sure if uh, CEO NDA, if you'd like to also add quickly. Good afternoon, Chair, Honorable Chairperson, Honorable Members, uh, colleagues, Minister. Uh, mine is just uh, digitized on the, the volunteers and the ask that we've had at National Treasury. Safe to say that the way we've been working with uh, SASA in ensuring that the beneficiaries, especially the rural areas that have been highly affected by access in terms of this 350. So the ask in the main was to take care of that in partnership with SASA and also to ensure that the mandate that NDA is assist with that of dialogues. I think DG, you did touch on that as well, but we want to really intensify our dialogues because a lot of solutions lies in the community and we've since realized that. And we also want to further our indulgence in data collection, how the 350 has impacted the changes in the CSO sector. Because in the main, we know that communities have been affected businesses have been affected, but CSO sector has been uh, uh, affected uh, 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 like any other business, like anyone, but no one is paying attention to that environment where this sustainable livelihood, the survival of the very poor and vulnerable reliantly to these sustainable interventions that is offered by social development and, and NDA. So in the main, we want to ensure that we empower the volunteers to enhance and to entrench and to continue to dialogue for finding solutions. I think that's what I needed to add to DG. So with the 30 million, if we could get granted, it's little, we had asked for the 480 million, it's, it's little, but it's better than nothing. We want to pursue even private sector, even other international donors to buy into the idea of volunteers because we can see that there is a, 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 a a challenge in terms of making sure that we rebuild our society, a challenge that we need to intensify our social behavioral interventions 
as the mandate of social development and the mandate of NDA. Thanks, DG. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you very much, CEO. Uh, Chair, just a quick stat I'd like to draw your attention to. You know, on the slide that the chair, that uh, the CFO of SASA spoke to um, around the, the employment levels of people who have been, um, who have been applied for the grant, Shocking statistics here is around 50% of grant recipients, um, or rather um, of applicants um, in terms of the 350 grant, um, have not completed school, just over 50%. Um, and these have never had formal employment at all. Uh, and almost 50% um, uh, have matric or higher. And again, this is possibly indicative of the fact that the economy is not creating sharp enough jobs as we should. Um, and, you know, the kind of interventions that we're having are beginning to show a little bit of a, of, of, of a shift uh, in terms of us uh, trying to address some of these challenges. Chair, um, I think I'd leave it at that, unless, Chair, you, you, would, you would advise that we quickly answer those questions that you have uh, on, your, um, on, uh, on the documents that we receive from the, from the Secretary. If you could quickly do that if you are in. Please do that, DJ. Thank you very much, Chair. I think the first question, um, um, that, that was asked was around, um, you know, the um, you, you, um, just reassuring yourselves that uh, this allocation will be used in, in, most, in the most efficient and effective manner, particularly the 26.2 billion runs. Um, and I think uh, we, can con uh, we can confirm that indeed we've learned a number of lessons with, um, excuse me, the first iteration as the CEO has indicated. Of significance, though, is the fact that the AG raised in the report, uh, um, a chair would recall, that there is a challenge in terms of systems alignment uh, and interface um, across government in the whole. And therefore, uh, you found high levels of people accessing support measures, relief measures that they should not have been accessing. In other words, double dipping in a number of aspects um, or, or measures because there was no integration between our systems. Um, I think we've had some very, very constructive engagement with the Treasury in this regard, uh, wherein you know, they have also uh, in, uh, indicated that they would support us you know, in terms of trying to ensure that we get uh, the right places where we could get, um, uh, um, uh, or rather the, 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 the various support measures where we may not have gone to verify the information. We're now able to do that, uh, even in terms of the time frame, in terms of when they access the data versus when we access the data. We, you know, we, we've got a very good understanding in that, and I think that that will assist us in alleviating some of the fraudulent activities. And so, and of course, a very important aspect that we still need to work towards, which members raised even in the previous discussion that we had, with the committee is around ensuring that we get the grants money to circulate a lot more in the local economy. And I think, um, uh, again, this is the system of Boko, you know, not having to travel far distances to access their money and to buy food. When they come home, almost half of their money is used up on transportation costs, et cetera. So we're working hard on this and trying to really find solutions in terms of ensuring that we get money to circulate a lot more uh, in, in, in the economy. Um, I think another question you asked, Chair, was um, you know whether we are on track in terms of reaching the unemployment rates. Um, and my learned friend, Mr. Brenton, will quickly respond to that. Um, um, Mr. Fadbiri will quickly respond to that, please. Good, good afternoon, uh, Chairperson, honorable members. Um, well, as a country, we, 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 in terms of poverty, inequality, and, and unemployment, we haven't been doing well in in that sense, since uh, since democracy, unemployment has gotten progressively worse over the years, and 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 that has heightened now during the COVID pandemic. Poverty, we have been doing a lot better up to about 2015, and then we saw we we began to see an uptick in poverty again from 2015. Uh, and inequality, we we've we've just you know we've been progressively uh, getting worse as well to some extent. All of those indicators are pulled back uh, or, or dampened to a bit uh, as a result of, of our, our, our relatively large social social grant framework. Um, and what we did see during the COVID pandemic, we actually saw a swing in our poverty and inequality indicators, uh, and, and we actually did better in terms of poverty and inequality uh, uh, with the, at the height of the relief measures, which was about mid 2020. So we, for example, would have seen food poverty uh, the, at before COVID, we had about 20% of, uh, of our population below the food poverty line. Uh, we predicted that that would go up to as high as, I think it was as high as about 30s, somewhere in the 30s. 
but we actually saw it come down from 20 to 18 percent um, uh, by, by, after about three months of our relief interventions. And similarly with inequality, we saw it, uh, we actually saw a turn in that. But unemployment, we did not see. I mean, as we know, unemployment has, has gotten worse. Uh, I think the latest one does show a slight improvement, but still worse as uh, as what we were in terms of pre-COVID. Thanks, DG. And Jeff. Thanks, Brent. And again, uh, Chair, uh, just in the test to say that the interventions by government have actually assisted uh, in a very, very, very uh, great way. I think Nitzkram did a, a report also just to indicate that we've um, uh, also did better in terms of Gini um, over the short term that we introduced the grant. And I think that that's a significant move. The other questions, Chair, that you asked um, were around, you see, um, uh, the vacancy rates. I think we had about 66 um, or so posts out of the 695 or so, which probably puts us between seven and nine percent in terms of the vacancy rate um and um, i think we're working hard to try and ensure that we close that uh, that gap a lot more uh there are various uh, of course these are at various levels some are waiting security and uh, credit checks and uh, we also had um, a large number of people retiring uh, but also um uh, um, uh, um uh, resigning uh, from the organizations um and i think we're working very closely to try and ensure that we close the outstanding course as swiftly as possible I think the other question uh, that you also asked here was around um, the 26 billion rent. I, I think CEO uh, and the team at SASA, you could respond to some of these, particularly around the service providers that were awarded the contracts um, uh, in terms of systems enhancement. And there was questions around the two, uh, how did we get to 9.4 uh, uh, million uh, uh, estimates uh, and um, whether you know um, we could exceed the estimates of 9.4 citizens, 9.4 million citizens. Um, and um, I think uh, what is also, uh, what happens if we exceed that, uh, you know, what is, what is plan B? Um, uh, and uh, I think in terms of the grants, uh, it was whether we were surprised at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the, at the uptake um, in terms of, uh, especially given the unemployment and poverty dis, uh, distribution across the country. Um, and then uh, I think there was last question around educational level, which I think I tried to respond to CEO. Uh, cha cha chairperson and members, I think on the issue of the allocation of the budget, we have been negotiating with all the different uh, stakeholders to make sure that we can uh, make sure that we get a good value for money in terms of the processes that we're using. Minister at the beginning indicated that we use a, a, a system which is old technology, whereby we actually don't have uh, people being trained at university anymore. We believe that the opportunity that we have is to make sure that we can begin to do better and more uh, data analytics uh, in terms of doing planning and supporting government as a whole, but also in terms of making sure that we can evolve in terms of using uh, old systems to new systems. The other opportunity we have is to learn and make sure that we create a learning opportunities for our people in terms of uh, the, the, the partners that we work with with spe specific reference to people that are assisting us on the call center side, because they are also using a young people that they are training to be able to ensure that uh, we continue, even if it's not directly through us, to employ young people and improve uh, employment rates uh, in the country as a whole. The other opportunity we're looking at is what are the things that we can do as we evolve through this process to also find opportunities amongst any, any of the people that we work with uh, to ensure that uh, uh, our beneficiaries, we can also continue to add a value uh, uh, to them and make sure that the citizens benefit more. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, thanks, Chair. I think that brings us to the end, uh, Honorable Chair um, and Honorable Members. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, in absentia, she 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 excused herself. There's a cabinet for Hutla, which she she needed to go and attend. But uh, thank you very much for the introduction she gave us. Thank you, DG, uh, CFO, uh, CEOs, uh, for uh, for the for the presentation. I think what we'll do now, I'll be requesting the other members who would like to interact with their presentation uh, to indicate. You know how we do it, other members. Matafa. 
Honorable Mike Sarupin. Papa. Honorable Sarupin. Kaiso. Honorable Kaiso. Okay, when the other oral members, they, it's always a problem of uh, connectivity, uh, but I'm sure they'll, they'll indicate um, if they've got something that they would like to, to raise with you, Honorable Mem uh, 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 Team uh, of DSD Portfolio. Uh, Honorable Matafa, give it a call. Thank you, Chairperson. Let me first start by apologizing. I'm not sure if either I'm clearly audible because my network has been unstable for quite some time. Very audible. Having... Awesome, Chair. Thank you very much. And having said that, I'm going to request to keep my video off in order to protect the little connectivity that I have. Chair, I'll first start. Uh, I'll start first by passing my regards to yourself, uh, the Minister, CEO, and, and CFO. And at the same breath, Chair, be a bit personal and wish my wife uh, the happiest birthday. And thank you for allowing me to pull myself out of her celebrations to come and do some work. Chair, having said that, I firstly welcome the presentation. As, as presented, it's very clear and it is really assisting. And I'm not sure if either will the committee agree with me, but the 26.2 billion that uh, is being advanced as the pro proposed support is very much welcome, considering the challenges that the country is facing in dealing with issues of uh, unemployment uh, inequality, as well as, as, as poverty. Now, Chair, having said that, I, I just wanted to check in regards to the capacity to perform its work and ensure that the allocations that are allocated are dispensed in line with uh, what they're intended uh, for. There is an issue that we normally rise on as a committee of uh, vacancies that uh, remain a, a sore point in many departments. Understanding the point that the country currently is not doing well, economic wise and our fiscal is not as strong as possible as it should. How are the vacancy rate impacting on the ability of the department to do its work. What is the vacancy rate, particularly uh, in SASA, as, as well as uh, I'm raising on SASA, especially because this is for me where most of our beneficiaries are touched by the most of the efforts that are being advanced to alleviate the hardship uh, uh, that are caused by the pandemic now together with the unrest. On, on contracts, Chair, of the enhancement systems for, for SASA, ha have the contracts been allocated? If, if, if yes, it would be interesting to find out on the racial spread as well as the gender profile of the ownership of such service providers because we all know that in the main, those uh, groups that are still marginalized from the mainstream economy remain mainly black and remain mainly female and youth. So it would be interesting to find out what efforts have been made to ensure that that balance is struck, that as much as we then advance our systems, we also are mindful of the challenges that are facing the, this particular sectors of society. The last one, Chair, is on the 9.4 million beneficiaries. I'm interested to, to find out, is this our target as far as the, the social relief of distress grant is concerned? Is this the target of the department? If not, how did we arrive at it? Could it be based on the uptake from the initial offering and if not maybe can we be taken on board in terms of how we reach this particular 9.5 million and then also chair coupled to that i just want to find out do, will this allocation be able to cover unexpected increases once they are open and and uh, for some reason the 9.4 is exceeded in terms of uptake 
what then, how do we augment the difference between the funds that are allocated and what is actually the actual up uptake? And um, to, to find out just how then do we respond to that? Should there be an increase of this particular uh, 9.4 million uptake that we have experienced or as was presented to us? Chair, let me pause there and, and thank you for the opportunity to engage in the presentation. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Chair, um, let me start by asking, with regards to the Social Relief, relief of Distress Grants, um, firstly, there were instances I've seen in the press and so on of, of individuals who were not supposed to be receiving the grant able to get through the vetting system. And I'm hoping that someone can, from SASA can tell me how that happened, that we had civil servants and people in full-time employment um, able to claim some of their grants um, and what steps are being taken to recover some of those monies. And I realize that's with SASA, not the department, but maybe they, they can give us a high level picture of what was going on there. And more broadly with regards to fraud detection, um, to make sure that in the constrained fiscal environments, the only individuals receiving grants are the deserving recipients and not people who are in full-time employment above the, the income threshold for those particular grants. Um, and what, what, uh, what mechanisms are in place to ensure that we uh, have better controls over that so that we don't have fraudulent grant recipients. Then, Chair, my second question is with regards to the DSD green paper that was published and withdrawn. Um, considering the, the macroeconomic environments and considering the fact that we, we are in a, a very constrained situation where we've got to focus on recovery, why did the department choose at this, inst at this particular time period to issue that paper and then withdraw it after the outcry, um, knowing that it triggered a tremendous, amount of, um, a tremendous amount of backlash, but also eroded trust in the state at the time when the, when the environment is constrained. And I'd like to know what lessons they learned from that and how they'll go about introducing these, these things in future, as well as how they intend in coordinating with the National Treasury on social security reform. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Honorable Sarupen. Honorable Kaiso. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, let me also uh, acknowledge the the input made earlier by the minister in, in her absence now, and the presentation made by the entire team of the Department of Social De uh, Development. And, and let me also at this stage uh, also wish uh, Mema Tafa a bright day during her birthday uh, today, and hopefully, uh, that the matafa will bring us a, a piece of uh, the remains of the cake on a lighter note chair. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, let me go quickly on just two uh, issues here, uh, chair. I just want to check the national development plan uh, does say that by 2030, at least we should have reduced poverty, you know, uh, 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 by 6% in, in 2030. Now, given this developing situation in the country where the economy has this challenge uh, and, 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 and additional to uh, challenge brought by COVID-19, do you think that I, is, is the department still foreseeing uh, this percentage being achievable uh, of 6%? And if not, uh, what would you propose uh, moving forward given this circumstance? Secondly, it's on the issue of, uh, I'm not sure whether given the, the challenge that our, if you look around the country and many cities and uh, key areas where our people are receiving uh, this grant, there are, uh, number of our people in, 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 in queues. Uh, so now I, I'm just asking myself, out of the current registration since September, the start of September, 
Are there any other applicants who uh, who gave up during the first registration that you carried over? Or is it purely the, the calculation from just September up until now? And thirdly, is on the issue of this quite interesting information that you shared with this committee, especially around the issue of the applicants, uh, where you said 50%, uh, you notice that it is made up of uh, applicants who have not completed their schools and just above 40, 45 uh, or 40%. Um, made make the list of the unemployed. So very interestingly, I just want to know whether looking at the unemployment statistic uh, given uh, recently, especially from the second quarter to where we are now, obviously the, the, there's a high, high, high rate of unemployment not seen before that we're struggling with, with the struggling economy. Now, I just want to check when you were drawing up these uh, figures or calculations or percentage or make up this uh, proposal, did you also consider accommodating uh, this, uh, the, the statistics given by the state South Africa with regard to unemployment? How does the two or the two figures or percentage that you talked about, the 50% and above 40% of unemployment do reflect within that broader statistic that you say. Obviously, Chair, one would uh, uh, agree that perhaps as a committee, we need uh, the issue of the uh, recommendation by the committee should be appreciated that uh, this grant uh, should be considered for even extension beyond 2022, uh, March 2022, given the distress that the economy is finding itself. And when I'm referring to that distress, I'm not only referring the portion complicated by COVID-19, I'm also uh, 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 adding the complications of the the, 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 the crisis before COVID-19 as well, because the economy was already not well by that time. So obviously the, this addition, additional burden it does say there needs to be a consideration of other measures that would boost up, uh, whether it's in a form of a basic income grant or something, but it has to be closely looked, monitored because it's, it sounds a tickling, uh, a ticking bomb this kind of a situation of uh, unemployment, especially where it affects the youth, you know, uh, we can imagine. So uh, that would be a brief from myself, uh, uh, Honorable Chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Kaiso. Uh, Any other role member would like to come in? Okay. Let, let, uh, uh, let me come in. Thank you very much again, uh, uh, <clears throat> DSD portfolio. Thank you, honorable members. Um, well, uh, happy birthday to, to Mrs. Matafa. Please convey our well wishes to, to, to her and thank her for allowing you to join us today. Uh, <clears throat> now I'm vocally wounded, uh, Matafa, but that's, that's, that's fine. Um, I think it, my first question is related to Honorable Sarupen's uh, 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 question, <clears throat> but I think I'm just broadening a little bit, saying uh, how prevalent was uh, malfeasance uh, during the first round of 350, 350 rand SRD, the nature of that, uh, of that uh, uh, malfeasance, and uh, what has been done about it. Uh, my second question, in your presentation, uh, uh, you, you keep on, on referring to the post office and you keep on, on, on referring to the banks. Um, uh, would, would, would you mind just uh, uh, sharing with the, uh, with the committee uh, the nature of the relationship between uh, uh, SASA and the, and, and, the, and the post office on one end and then uh, 
the the relationship between Sasa and 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 and, and the bank. Obviously, we're not, we're not looking for the old agreement here. Some sudden features of those relationships. Um, and how would you rate the service that you are getting from uh, from those institutions? You as providers of this uh, of this service, but again, what is the response that you are getting from um, uh, the recipients of, uh, uh, of 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 the grants? Are there any challenges that have that have uh, that you have been having uh, uh, with uh, the, the 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 post the post office? Uh, at the same time, any challenges that you have been having with the uh, with the banks, and if they are there, um, again, I'm sure you'll share with us the nature of those uh, challenges. But more importantly, how are you dealing with them? I heard that you, uh, uh, this next question, you um, you you are talking about the call centers, and uh, if I'm correct. Uh, those call centers are, are outsourced. Um, why don't you insource the 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 the, 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 the call the call centers? Yeah. During uh, next question, um, during the first wave of of COVID nineteen, right? Uh, Gerald, we were able to to mobilize civil society, to mobilize businesses, to intervene, especially around the food parcels. But uh, what I've seen now is that with the, um, the following waves, we seem to have taken the food off the pattern because the, that problem is not just a government problem, it's a societal problem that we are dealing with. Firstly, is my observation correct? And if it is correct, why? Uh, and but most importantly, uh, is it something that perhaps you think that can be changed? I'm 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 throwing these things to DSD portfolio because uh, uh, you are directly affected by the recipients of 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 these food parcels and so on. But uh, it, you shouldn't read that this that's only your responsibility as DSD portfolio. But I think uh, the expectation would be from us that perhaps we should champion that. I would, I would, um, <clears throat> yeah. I think that for now, those those would be my uh, my, my questions. And uh, back to you, DG. Then you decide who answers what. Thank you. Yeah, we are muted, DG. You are still muted. Still muted. Yeah, you are fine now. But but we don't hear you. But I can see that you are no longer muted. From uh, oral members, can can hear the DJ? Is this my problem? Oral members, no, can chair, I, ca I cannot. No, we it. we can't hear either, chair. Okay, so it means the problem is with the DJ. Can you try again, DJ, to to connect? Okay, you you may you may have to go, um, yeah, sign out, and uh, uh, then um, can can uh, the, the colleagues from Sasa in the meantime, perhaps start addressing the questions which they think uh, uh, relate to them while the DG is trying to reconnect. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, th uh, thank you, honourable members. I will uh, respond to some of the questions that are specific to Sasa and uh, get uh, the other colleagues to add uh, if there's uh, things that I may leave out. Uh, Chair, the first question by Honorable Member Matafa was on the issue of the capacity uh, to deliver what it is that we need to do and the level of vacancies that we actually have in, in our environment. It's very important to highlight uh, the fact that our budgets, like all other budgets, have been cut uh, over the period. And we, as an institution, like all other government uh, uh, departments, have had to cater for the agreement that has been agreed with uh, organized labor. So some of the money that we have to pay employees is money that was not necessarily within uh, our budget. 
But in terms of the overall numbers that we currently are experiencing uh, in our, our, on our side in terms of the vacancy rate is 5%. What we've done as an institution is to look at a process where we can make sure that there is a balance in terms of capacity that uh, exists ac across and we set up a structure that we called a uh, identification of key and critical posts to make sure that uh, each and every region has got some level of capacity for them to be able to deliver what they need to deliver. What becomes important to highlight is that with the, the, the process that we currently are using, particularly for 350, because it's digital, it does not necessarily need a lot of hands, but it needs very high level skills for us uh, to make sure that we deliver this. We need more uh, people to help us on the data analytics side. We need uh, high level skills on cybersecurity to make sure that we deliver on these. And as we're evolving, we're looking at how can we ensure that those skills exist in the uh, organization so that we can build capacity for the future and be able to deliver on those. Hence, we're, we're, we're looking at where do we add a, a, a capacity and what are the things that we do differently. So the gap is there in terms of uh, the people on the ground, but again, it's, it's because we just don't have the funding for us to be able to fund everything that may be approved, but not necessarily have the money. Just for this particular year, we've lost about 350 million on cost of employees. Therefore, it means that we need to be careful on how we fill the jobs so that we don't have a challenge down the line whereby we fill the jobs and we, we, we are not able to pay the people. The other question that was asked uh, uh, by, uh, was on the issue of why 9.4 million. As we're engaging with the different stakeholders, we had to look at what do we, what is it that we can project based on on the previous numbers, and we've, uh, we 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 may have to come back and uh, uh, go back uh, to, to to the different structures. Should we exceed the 9.4 million? Because if the need is there. Uh, we can't uh, 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 turn people back, but at the same time, we can't use money that we don't have. So if this is the only allocation we have, which would be for 9.4 million, it therefore means once we exceed that, we may have a challenge. But when we look at what we, we actually provided previously, we're able to provide, uh, on the 350, we're able to provide the grant to 6 million people. And we want to believe that the 3.5 million is reasonable in terms of what the uh, potential uh, increase is going to be. The other question that was asked uh, by Honorable Luceruben was in relation to uh, the public servants that uh, 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 came through the system uh, previously in terms of the, uh, the first uh, tranche that we did. It's very important to indicate that the first two months that we started this process because there was desperation in terms of us making sure that we begin to pay people we did not have other databases. For example, we didn't have PESAL or PESOL, and we did not have the database that links to people that are in prison. And we also didn't have other databases good in, in, in good time so that we could ma make sure that uh, those people don't come through, in, through the process. What we have since done is on a monthly basis, we will getting refreshed database from uh, the different institutions and we continue to look at signing SLAs with them so that we can ensure that we actually improve uh, uh, in this regard so that we don't uh, uh, get people coming through the process. We're also engaging the banks in terms of seeing as to whether we, can, we cannot actually run through all uh, the people that have applied to make sure that the people that we actually uh, provide a grant are people that are in desperate need and not a, a, a people that may not necessarily need the money. So we would be checking through uh, the bank accounts so that we can make sure that we don't have too many inclusion errors and make sure that those people that should not be in the system are gotten out of the system. On the fraud detecting, uh, detecting system, we continue to work very closely with the other uh, um, uh, uh, structures that are looking at the fraud side. Hence, for example, we have a number of people that we did not, much as they were not declined, but because we've picked them up in other fraud systems uh, that, for example, may be part of what the banks use and we've had to hold back and not be able to give them the grants. And I know that this is where we're ha having 
the biggest noise in terms of uh, the people that say I should have been paid a grant, but I haven't. But it's for it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't also enable and allow fraud to happen, not only in our system, but holistically in the in the financial uh, uh, system. The question that was uh, asked by the chair was, uh, what is our relationship uh, with SAPO versus the banks? Just to clarify, Chair, is that on our normal grants, uh, the current numbers that we have is that that is not, I'm not talking to SRD 350, but our normal grants. Uh, of the, of the uh, almost 12 million people that we pay, 70% of the people get paid through the post office. But it's very important to highlight that even though these are post bank, post office clients, uh, or beneficiaries that actually have the orange uh, Sasa card, the bulk of them get their money through a whole range of other structures in the national payment system. They would go to retail shops, they would go to the banks, and the number of clients that go to the post office inside the post office are about 500,000 clients, which is about 4% that would walk into a post office, and the rest, uh, uh, we've got about 200,000 clients that would go and get paid in what we, call, we refer to as pay points, which is one of the most expensive uh, model of payment, which is something that we need to look at in terms of how do we improve in relation to that, that going forward. In CEO, terms of the current... CEO, instead of interrupt, uh -huh. uh, let's, it's slow now, we are, we, are, we, are we are talking about 12 million recipients of your normal grant, right? One, and then you said 70% of them get their money through the post, supposed to put it through the post office. This then start from that 70% and then you started okay. going to what's happening. Okay. So of that 70% that have a, a bank account, which is uh, the bank account that is the post office, post bank, SAS card, mm -hmm. a number of them would not go inside the post office to go and draw their money. They would draw their money in the national payment system, uh, which therefore means that they would go to retailers, they would go to ATMs and withdraw their money there. So we could argue that the people have actually voted with their feet and looked at what is it that there is convenient. And again, because they, they, they're using a card, it therefore means that, that they have a wider choice in terms of uh, platforms that they can use to transact or also to withdraw their money. That's on our normal clients. Of the SRD just, clients in- Just, yes, just, yes, just sir. There. okay. Uh, I take it that when, uh, when you, there's, there's, there's a rate that you, put, you pay the post office for, that, for their service, right? That's number one. Two, who, who pays uh, the other uh, pay points for those people that are carrying the, the post office bank card? Who pays, who pays them? And the question is that, is that the optimal way of, 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 of doing this thing? Because my question would be, why don't you as, as SASA, for instance, directly um, uh, contract with whoever the ultimate payer? The payer is us as a, a, a chair because we deposit the money in the bank accounts of the individuals. So we pay the money. The post <laughs> office is used as the distribution channel and not necessarily the payer of the of the grant. Whether no. it's no, 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 no. The transaction I'm interested, who pays the transaction costs? Who pays the transaction costs? The transaction costs for all the people that get paid uh, through the post of that have got post office accounts, the transaction costs are actually paid by us. Uh, mm. uh, and we, we pay a range of, of, of different prices. On, on the, on the uh, cash pay points, the rate is higher. And on the over the counter is equally higher. But on the NPS, we pay about six rand for all those people that go through. So it depends on which platform are you actually using to disperse or to get your money that we, we decide on how much it is that we pay. On those clients that are banking with the banks, they actually uh, carry the costs themselves 
uh, in terms of the banking transactions because it depends on which bank uh, they are actually banking with. Okay. 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 And then of the new client of of the new uh, beneficiaries, which are the SRD beneficiaries, chair, uh, is that now that in this uh, 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 particular process we've given clients choice to say give us your bank account, it's been very interesting to see that most of the clients uh, made their choice in terms of which bank uh, they go to, and the majority of them. Uh, have not necessarily come back uh, to get paid through the SAP or post bank uh, a platform because of the challenges that we had in the past whereby people had to go and queue uh, for them to get their, their, their money, their 350. And we had a number of challenges where people were queuing and uh, people were made to pay. So the fortunate thing is that post bank post office has also come up with alternative channels so that we can ensure that people don't have to go and queue for them to get their money because not only does it impact on the issue of COVID, it just also impact in terms of convenience of the people and then it does, uh, we noted that it became a challenge uh, hence we're not going to be utilizing the over the counter except for those people that don't have anywhere else to go. So on with regards to the relationship chair, we have a very good relationship with all the people that pay our grant beneficiaries to a, a point whereby uh, each and a, prior to any payment run will have engagements with uh, the retailers, the banks, and the post office to look at what is this going, how is, is the payment run going to impact on each of our clients and also uh, including the people that actually distribute the cash so that we can make sure that our clients are not inconvenienced and it was amazing to see the partnership that we had during the time when both KZN and Gauteng were affected by the riots, that the banks actually came to provide support and actually uh, uh, um, uh, together with the retailers to make sure that there was sufficient money to be able to pay uh, the people that needed to, to, to be paid. The, the other question, Chair, that was raised by uh, um, uh, Honorable uh, uh, Gaiso was uh, with regards to the issue of uh, of poverty reduction and uh, the, the 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 what it is that we can achieve as a country in terms of making sure that we achieve the six uh, six percent that has been agreed on in terms of the national uh, payment uh, uh, um, NDP. This is going to be a challenge, particularly now with regards to COVID, uh, but I believe uh, it's, a, it's a strategy that is a government strategy that needs to be worked on to make sure that we improve on those. I see that DG is up and ready. DG, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, are you, Chair. Are you, are you done with your, your... Yes, I am done, Chair, because I have uh, responded to the issue of the, of the statistics, but I didn't respond to the issue of the call center. I don't know if the DG wants to take that question. Okay. DG, i back. He still is not audible. DG, what's happening? Um, we still can't hear the, 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 the DG. The, yeah. the other colleagues are with the DGs. Anybody who, who, who can come in? Yeah, th th thanks, thanks, Chair. Uh, it's Mr. Nishpari, GDG for Community Development. There was a question in terms of the uh, food, uh, provision of food, and the, the issue of the donor fatigue. Um, we, we need to uh, put across uh, honorable members that um, the department uh, has got a system where they provide food. Uh, to vulnerable people that has been profiled in most of the areas. And um, but during the violence, the, the need uh, was too much to understand that it depleted the budget that we have. We have to go out and request uh, some donors, including Solidarity Fund, so that we can cover the areas where we could see that there's not enough uh, food at the center based feeding program uh, that we have. And we, we were working with several civil society organizations that, uh, that 
uh, pledges, pledges that they will need to support the, the, um, uh, the food in different areas, especially in KwaZulu Natal and in Gauteng. In Gauteng, they brought all the food to our um, food distribution centers in all districts, and then we distributed that. One of the things you could see when the donor funding comes in that the numbers will have increased in terms of the food parcels that uh, were provided. But um, as a department, we, we have a system where vulnerable people are fed uh, on a daily basis uh, using the budget that we, we have. We, there is a need, we have been requesting that I think the food relief budget needs to be increased a little bit because COVID has created or exacerbated the condition on the ground due to poverty. Those that will not, pro they won't be able to qualify for 350 and they won't have food because they just lost their jobs. So the food relief that the department uh, provide need extra funding in the, in the KZN, they started the program on um, provision of a food um, voucher, which in this financial year, the, there were legal money that uh, within the three months period, the budget was uh, completed. So there is a need for, for to relook at the appropriation of uh, extra money for, for food in, 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 in everywhere. You will see that when the DG was doing the, the, the contextual analysis, the number of people that are poor now is higher and also the vulnerability. People were made more vulnerable by COVID. A lot of jobs were lost. The violence exacerbated that situation. So there's really a need to really look into both approaches, 350 plus also extra money for the food security. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson and members. Thank you. Uh, Chair, I'm hoping you can hear me now. Very well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can I then, my apologies for, for, we're for the technology. We're to say, <laughs> so I used uh, a different device. My sincere apologies. Okay. Um, Chair, let me then quickly ask Brenton to come in and then I'll come in and close at the end. Thank you, sir. Thanks, uh, Honorable Chairperson DG. So there was a few questions related to the costing of the grant um, and, and the, the impacts on COVID on the economy. Um, so just, just to, to give a slight background on how, how some of the numbers were, 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 were costed. Um, we, what we did was, because there was just no data, especially in the first iteration, there was just no data available that told us what the impact of COVID was. We, 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 and to some extent, we've, we've, that has improved, but we don't have the comprehensive service that we, that we always relied on. And COVID has changed the country quite a lot. We, we basically had to simulate what we thought was happening. And so we used what was our best survey at the time, which was the National Income Dynamics Survey of 2017. We used the stats essay uh, quarterly labor force data, and we, we upgraded all those surveys to 2020. Uh, and then for the 2021, we upgraded it with the, with the December, the, the last quarter, uh, uh, the 2020 last quarter QL, QL, the quarterly labor force survey. So that basically was a simulation of uh, what we think is happening in our country uh, as a result of the COVID pandemic. The reason why I've, I've given the detail there is that all of these are simulations. So there's obviously huge amounts of risk in, in that, uh, in the calculations of those numbers. It's, it's not like a normal survey where you go out and based on you know, statistical probabilities, you're probably gonna get very accurate, very good numbers. Here we have to make assumptions on assumptions on assumptions uh, to, to get to that. So even the 9.4 that is there is part of a range that we put forward to the treasury, which is from 9.4 to 11.4, uh, which is the upper range where we see, you know, if, if we, at worst case scenario, if, we, if these things went wrong and the numbers were much higher than we predicted, it could be as much as 11.4, which does put a significant risk uh, on, on this budget. Although 
we're not seeing that risk come through in the first round. So this, this grant has been open in the first month. We note that the applications are a lot higher than what it was in the when we opened it for the very first time in May last year, but we've not yet hit that uh, sort of 9.4 mark. You know, I think we're now only in, in a, around 8 million or so um, of, of approved applications. Right? We've got, we, we got 12 million uh, we've got 12 million um, applications. The last round, we got 9 million applications and we, we only we approved about six. So at the moment we've approved just, I think just over eight. So I think for the first month, we're still in the safe zone. We obviously will monitor this very closely on a month to month basis. So we're gonna have some savings maybe in the first month, which can roll over to offset maybe some over expenditure in the last month. But like we did with the pre previous iteration of the grant, we monitor this very closely. Uh, we liaise with Treasury as well. We hope that you know if 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 that uh, if we do have a budget or we foresee a budget overrun as we come to the second or third uh, towards the end, say January next year, um, that that if there's a need, that they will will hopefully provide an additional allocation or make some adjustments. We they've allowed us to make some interesting accounting adjustments uh, in the current year when we when we when we extended the grant um, in January uh, which we couldn't run a budget process or uh, through it but we, we they managed to find a way for us to to get some money to just do that extension when we did that in, in sort of right at the end of the year in January so again I think the mechanisms are there if more money is needed uh, 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 there is some experience in doing that and we do try to track these things very closely uh, and keep keep our treasury uh, uh, updated on where we're going with these numbers. Um, we do also believe that this is a ticking time bomb. We saw what happened in April when the grant was stopped for about three months, uh, uh, or the or the unrest that we also seen in, seen in July. We 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 do think that there is a need for for a, a, a an extension beyond this, probably given the current situation, what most of the predictions are at least for a minimum of three years. Uh, that's just to get us probably back to where we were prior to COVID, but as the honorable member mentioned, but even before COVID, this was a challenge. Um, and, and we've seen the positive impact this is having on poverty and inequality. You know, this, this should be considered as a sort of a more longer term intervention. Uh, to, to begin to address these, these issues around poverty and inequality and more holistically, together with the, uh, with the um, economic re re recovery and reconstruction plan, which also then aims to boost, uh, create a million or two million. I think it's, I think it's uh, created about 700,000 in the last round and there's aimed to do another million. And so that does relieve some of the pressure, but we're not going to get to the full 11 million people in a very short space of time. And so the need for, 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 for the sort of social relief or a more permanent type of grant is, uh, is, is warranted. Um, um, I think, am I, DG, I think I've covered? Yes, I think you covered, Brenton. Um, Brenton, we're good? Yes, I, yes, I'm good. I, Thank you, uh, Chairperson, and thank you. And once again, my sincere, oh, my sincere apologies around this It's really giving me a hard time today. So maybe just to latch on what Brenton said, I do think that um, because of the place in terms of where we are as a country, um, that um, uh, a sort of longer term solution would be um, um, a, a phased in basic income grant. Um, uh, and I think that this is very important, um, you know, given the, 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 the challenges we are facing in the economy at the moment. Um, what that will do, Chair, was, is that it would address the issues of poverty in a very short space of time. Um, not completely, but it will have a massive impact uh, on, 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 on the reduction of poverty. Um, and uh, of course, what we do also advocate for very strongly uh, is um, the, the, the aspect of ensuring that we create, um, 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 uh, uh, you know, um, what is the word now? We, we create uh, opportunities for um, getting people actively involved in the economy. 
uh, because that in, uh, encourages self-sustainability uh, as indicated at the, at the beginning of the, of the presentation that I made. Maybe just three quick points I want to, to respond to. The one is on the, excuse me, on the issue of the call center. Um, you know, previously with the first iteration, we used a bot enabled, uh, we used bot enabled technology. Uh, in other words, you didn't have uh, warm bodies behind the phone, but it was all digital. Uh, and I think that assisted in terms of ensuring that no drop calls uh, were made and every single question and, um, uh, and, and calls that came in were actually responded to. Um, uh, you know, I think um, the aspect of insourcing is a very interesting and very important aspect. And I, 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 we, we started a conversation on it, to be honest with you, Chair, but we really never followed through on it. And I think that we need to open this discourse a little bit more um, and uh, hopefully come back to you, you know, with, um, uh, with, the, with, the, with the value proposition on this particular matter at some point. I, I made a statement earlier, which I want to just correct in a way. Uh, you, you know, I, I indicated that, um, 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 you, you know, the, the, the educational levels, uh, you know, almost mimic, uh, the, the, you know, the, the challenges we face in the economy. I think I shouldn't have necessarily focused on that um, because, uh, you know, because of the structure of our economy as a country. Um, uh, there, there's somewhat very weak relations between uh, education, um, educational levels and economic uh, participation. There's a huge, uh, uh, it, it may say certain things, but it's not a very uh, uh, reliable tool always um, to focus on. What I should have placed emphasis on though, is um, the fact that in certain districts um, in our country or specific municipalities, they are higher, uh, uh, um, 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 uh, 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 they are higher uh, grant recipients, so for example, uh, in the Northern Cape, I can't remember the specific uh, district, but I know that there's a district in the Northern Cape where almost 90% uh, of, 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 uh, of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of people who are in the district, um, between 80 and 90, if I'm not mistaken, are grant recipients in the entire city, uh, in the entire district rather. Uh, and um, uh, the reason why we wanted to zoom in on that is that so that we can locate where the challenges are in terms of um, uh, in a particular district, there are a lot of, there are more people uh, um, uh, in terms of the number of people applying for grants versus uh, against the population of the of this specific area. And then we would know that those are the areas that require uh, economic interventions uh, uh, quite strongly. Um, then uh, there was a question asked around the green paper um, uh, that we published uh, at some point and then further withdrew. I think uh, it's important just to highlight that uh, we really wanted to um, uh, to provide better clarity um, on some aspects uh, of the of the green paper. Hence, we withdrew. Um, uh, but you know, um, uh, indeed, there was uh, public discourse um, around around the matter. But um, the essence is that we wanted to provide some clarity, particularly on aspects around the national uh, uh, social security fund. Uh, you know, which is work that we we, we are working on. Um, um, you know, uh, but uh, indeed, we withdrew because. Uh, there were some areas that were not uh, as clear as they should have been, and in some cases may have even been um, uh, misinterpreted uh, uh, in terms of those proposals. Chair, I think um, I may have dealt with all the questions. Um, yeah, just on the food on the food um, aspect, um, you know, Chair, you, you asked the question whether, uh, you know, is the, for lack of a better word, uh, donor fatigue. I think that we've, uh, Peter's responded, but I think that um, um, South Africans uh, are, are generally giving people. And I think that um, we have seen a lot of support coming in. In fact, just this morning, uh, I, I received an email um, uh, from uh, a particular organization saying, look, we want to contribute towards uh, becoming a solution in, in, in KZN in, in some areas that are still uh, affected, uh, you know, um, uh, following the looting uh, or the unrest, and they want to come in on board and assist. And these are partners that have previously worked with us before. Uh, and I think so. So, so um, they, 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 there's a lot of uh, support that we're still getting from the clergy, uh, interfaith leaders, a lot of support that we're getting from NGOs, uh, from individuals, from the private sector. And I think that. Um, this, uh, this level of, of support is something that will certainly need to continue. Of course, uh, if we're able to get more, we'd be able to ensure that nobody goes to bed hungry. Uh, uh, and, um, and, and, and I think that, um, uh, you know, just to really, uh, we must appreciate the hard work that has been done by all uh, these organizations in terms of supporting and ensuring that, um, and in a way, I think we're building a social compact of ensuring that we, we, we take care of each other 
uh, in the country um, and making sure again as indicated that nobody goes hungry. So Chair, um, I want to really appreciate the, 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 the questions and the comments uh, really raised by the members and I think that uh, there are a number of aspects that we need to obviously go back and really think about internalize uh, and that the next time that we come back to you uh, we would be able to engage um, you, you know uh, based on some of the aspects that uh, the committee has read but we really appreciate the guidance of the committee in the main uh, and uh, indeed the wisdom uh, um, uh, that has been uh, provided to us in terms of some of the recommendations that have come through uh, indeed so thank you very much honorable chairperson and honorable members thank you, thank you so so much at, 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 at dg but before i i let you step down um were there any prisoners who who tried to uh, uh, to access the grant i know they can be very creative <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> yes chief. Uh, indeed they were um mm -hmm. I think the CEO will help me here. I think there may have been just over 200, if I'm not mistaken. I can't remember the exact numbers. CEO, you're not coming quickly on that, but indeed they were, uh, particularly with the first iteration. Uh, there the were uh, um, uh, prisoners that, that applied and, and some were approved because it was before we got the database. But the advantage that we had with the first iteration is that people had to go to the post office physically to get their money. So because they did, had to go physically, they didn't have an option or an opportunity for them to get that money because we could not, we had situations where some people sent their relatives and the relative would say, I'm coming to get a grant for my brother who's in prison. Obviously we did not give the money to anybody else. So even though they may have applied and may have been approved, but never they never got uh, that money. There's a question chair that was asked earlier on as to how, do we have a, 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 a possibility whereby people gave up to go and get their money because of just the, the, the frustration of having to go through the queues and all those challenges? Yes, the possibility is there because we have about 500,000 uh, uh, grants that were not uh, collected from the post office while engaging uh, with, uh, with DSD to look at whether we can still allow those people who were in the previous uh, reiteration for them to be able to get uh, uh, their grant still, and obviously not to get it over the counter because it does uh, become a frustration. But now that we have other opportunities, we can have that, but the directions would have to be changed. Uh, Chair, the other question was with regards to the call center to say, why are we not insourcing the call center? Just for perspective um, is that, in our regions, we have what we call a help desk where clients would call in in Western Cape in Free State. And that would normally, because it's just a help desk, have about four to five people. And in our call center, which is our normal call center, we only have 35 people. And there's no way they can uh, be able to provide support to the number of clients that we now have who have doubled. What we're looking at, Chair, is for us to make sure that we have actually a call center that can service the whole portfolio. So we're currently looking at what the strategy should be for us to have the whole portfolio looking at, uh, at, at, at focusing on providing support to all our beneficiaries, including on the social development side. But the, the other opportunity that exists, Chair, is with the institution that we're currently working on, is for them to be help to, to, to help us with regards to capacity building, but also for us to build the strategy of the future and uh, for us to make sure that we can provide support not only for the portfolio, but as we grow in the call center space, we can be able to provide for other parts of government. As DG said. In these, in, in these days, you can actually use uh, robots uh, to be able to, to respond to basic questions without necessarily needing a physical person, but it's an evolving strategy, Chair, uh, which I think, I believe we need to come back and indicate as to what the plan for the future is. The call center we've insourced has got 300 people. So we've just added 300 people to the 35 people that we have and the few people that we have in the regions. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Chair, maybe just to highlight um, the, the aspects around uh, the prisoners that you mentioned, uh, and I think even with some of the other, uh, you know, people who received the grant who should not have I, uh, um, uh, uh, received the grant. I think 
we 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 our discussions with the AG have been really really fruitful, and I think that um, the 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 what we do have now, which we didn't have before, is a sense of where the AG would ideally go and check whether we've actually verified against those specific data sets. Uh, and I think that will assist us because we'll be able to really cut out a lot of uh, people who um, uh, who are not deserving uh, to get the grant um, so that we can provide that support to those who are actually deserving. Uh, this is a, a significant step for us. Um, of course, you know, the AG has protocols in terms of how they access various data sets, et cetera. Um, and we, we're not tampering with that, but we now know that these are the 50 data sets uh, that we need to verify the applicants against, for example. And um, I think that that's going to assist us greatly. But I do think that, um, you know, there may be one or two uh, institutions or organizations where we still have a challenge in terms of accessing the data. And we're actively engaging those uh, to see that, uh, you know, we, we can quickly get uh, that data available. In some cases, um, uh, it may be expired data or outdated data, which needs to be um, obviously cleaned up before um, uh, we run it uh, to ensure that um, uh, you know uh, we, we cut out those who don't deserve it. So, but this is um, a work in progress. We're trying to do it quickly, um, um, you know, um, because we recently met with the AG. Uh, but we're really trying to do this as rapidly as possible because we understand the importance of recipients getting their money on time. Uh, but indeed, we do have to do a very thorough verification process in that as well. But thank you very much, Chair, for, for the questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, 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 DG and the, uh, your, your, your portfolio. I think it was a, a, a good intervention indeed. Um, <clears throat> I, I think generally the view that we take that under these very trying uh, uh, conditions is very important that uh, the, <clears throat> the most vulnerable people uh, are, are not allowed to suffer alone as government, as you have seen uh, before and uh, uh, during the start of the COVID and now, uh, as government, we've always tried to, uh, to intervene and within the constraints of the resources, try to make sure that uh, people do have uh, something to, uh, uh, to eat. Um, we are the first ones to say that it's, 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 not, it's, not, it's not enough, but it's in the nature of the constraint environment that we, uh, we are operating within. <clears throat> And uh, again, just thank the department, which is in the forefront of this, uh, because it's very important that uh, at, at all times we are, we are seen to be responsive uh, to the plight of the poorest of the poor, the people who need each and every cent that they can get in, into their pockets. Perhaps uh, um, one, one needs to um, uh, perforate the, the argument which you get in some circles, which one uh, wants to say that uh, it's like, the money is being thrown away or it's getting out of the economy. What is important to note is that with this money, um, <clears throat> um, the, 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 the intervention that we, uh, we, we, are, talk we are talking about uh, right, right now, <clears throat> uh, the 26.7 billion round uh, <clears throat> uh, in, the special in, the, in the special appropriation bill, um, is the money which is taken back to the economy. Um, the people, the recipients of this money, they've got a, a very high propensity to spend and therefore taking the money back in, in, into the economy. It increases the disposable income, uh, which again goes to the economy, more, more, more bread is, 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 is baked, uh, more flour, uh, more mini meal, um, and so on and so forth. So again, uh, people who sometimes want to come with argument who says perhaps it's the man which is wasted, they must disabuse them, themselves of that because it's the man which uh, we know for a fact that uh, it will go back to the economy with even higher multiplier effects uh, at the end of the day, contribute to uh, economic growth and GDP of the country. So uh, with those few words, thank you very much, DG and your team. Um, thank you, Chair. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Mr. Um, <clears throat> uh, let's let's continue with, with our our uh, agenda, honourable members. Uh, the the minutes uh, will deal with them at, 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 at tomorrow. Let me get announcements from uh, uh, Darren. Darren, what are announcements?
Hey, person, uh, nothing from me. Just uh, tomorrow we are meeting with DTIC, Department of Trade, Industry and Competition. Also on the, also on the bell, I'm going to send the link now immediately after I send the person to say. And again, same time. Yeah? Three o'clock tomorrow, yes, Chairperson. Yes. Honorable members, uh, once more, thank you very much for uh, for 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 you are attending and engaging with the with the with the with the, with the presentations, and uh, it's it's a very important intervention by by government that uh, we are we are we are busy with, and uh, thank the honor uh, the, the the support staff and everybody on the, on on the platform. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Chairperson. Ah, hey, hey, honorable. I uh, came late. I came late, Chairperson, and I decided to be a careful listener. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. So, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much, honorable Nenzano. No thanks, Chairperson. Okay. Cheers. Che, if I can abuse you while you're here, uh, my apologies, I should have left. I think your comment that you made at the end is very useful. Uh, quite often we get bashed a lot, um, you, know, around, um, you know, around that specific aspect that Abanta by Sebenzisima, et cetera. But I think you were spot on, and thank you very much for that comment. The money is certainly going back into the economy, Sabonga, and we really appreciate that, um, that, that, that you also view it that way. Perfect. Thanks, much. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Recording stopped.